Childer. Today's video is being sponsored by Sakani. All opinions are mine and mine alone. What is this? This is the Sakani X21 LED for vloggers. How much does it cost? Approximately $50. How's the battery life? At 100% output, you get about 45 minutes. At 50% output, you get an hour and a half. If you plug it to a USB power bank at 100% output, you get about two hours. How long does it take to recharge? Approximately one hour and 45 minutes. Does it flicker? Yes, but only if your shutter speed is over 1 1,000th. Can you light a scene with it? Yes, you can light a car scene like this, or you can light a dark scene like this. Would I recommend this light for your narrative lighting kit? Absolutely yes. Done, roll that intro. What's up everybody, you're watching Too Long Didn't Read Filmmaker, where the answers comes first, the reasons come last, but we are constantly and always still learning. So today is a very exciting video because today's video is being sponsored by Sakani. And Sakani has sent me their X21 LED. It's meant for vlogging. And everything you're about to hear is my opinions and my opinions only. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, real quick, let's just get the basics out of the way. So when you open the box, you're going to get yourself a little pouch. You're, the pouch is going to hold the LED itself as well as two magnetic plates. The magnetic plates are a white diffusion followed by a tungsten diffusion. On the other side, you're going to get yourself a hot shoe ball mount and this is what you can mount the LED to your camera. And then you also have a charging cable. Outside of the pouch, you're going to have a little carabiner for you to hook onto your backpack. And then you also have a set of color gels, which is awesome if you want to introduce some color into your scene. Now, if we look towards the LED itself, it's made out of solid aluminum, which is awesome for durability. There is a nice hard plastic in the front to protect your LEDs. However, this does scratch a little bit. It's not a very big deal. It's just something I think you should be aware of. Now, on the side over here, we have a power button. To power this LED, it's a little unique. You have to hold the power button for a couple seconds for the LED to turn on. You can tell this by the back screen. And then if you hit the power button one more time, the LED will finally turn on. And I think this is a safety measure, which is awesome because the last thing you want to do is accidentally bump the power button and then you drain the battery before you ever get to use it. Now over here, there is a micro USB charging port. You can use it with a USB power bank, but I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit later. On the top over here, we have two dimming buttons. Now you can either dim this in single increments or you can go in five or 10% increments if you hold the button. And of course the display is going to tell you everything as well as the battery life. Now on the bottom over here we have a quarter 20 screw which is awesome. It mounts to that uh, hot shoe ball mount that comes in the bag and if you have a gorilla pod that's where it gets interesting because you can start hanging this light in really odd places. Now flickering doesn't really happen at the lower shutter speeds but once you get up into the higher shutter speeds of like a thousand or so you'll start to see these really tiny little lines show up. So basically this is using something called like a high frequency dimmer instead of a voltage dimmer. Now the light throw is actually a flood. It's very, very wide. It's not a spot beam if that's what you're looking for. Woo, that was a whole lot of information. Let's get to the fun stuff. So it does have an internal battery. When you have it at full 100% output, the battery life is about 45 minutes, which is actually not that bad. When you're at 50%, you get about an hour and a half. Now, there is a USB port here, and that's how you charge the internal battery. Now, if you use a USB power bank, you'd think that you're gonna be able to just power the LED on indefinitely until that USB power bank goes out. I found that that is not true. At 100%, you're gonna get about two hours of output before the LED turns off. So what I believe is going on here is when you're using the LED at 100% brightness, you're actually using more power than the USB can recharge. So um, there's probably definitely a sweet spot somewhere, but just so you know, if you're gonna be counting on using a USB power bank at 100%, you're only gonna see about two hours before the LED turns off. Okay, with all that data out of the way, why did I feel this LED was worth reviewing? Because if you look at all the marketing material, this LED is actually being marketed as marketed, 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 oh gosh, 
If you look at all the marketing language, they are talking about this LED specifically for vloggers. And it makes sense because if you're vlogging at night and you need some light, this is awesome. It's small, it's compact, it's got an internal battery, and when you're not shooting yourself at night, then you go ahead and use a USB power bank and recharge it while you're not using it. So it makes total sense. But where does it make sense on a narrative level? Well, when I first received it, I was surprised at just how small this thing actually was and also how light it is considering it's made out of aluminum. So I started thinking, you know, this light might actually be very good and very handy if you're filming in a very tight space where you don't have the option of using a big old LED panel or Kino flows, what have you. This thing is small and it punches out a quite a bit of light. And also I thought, well, if it's so light, then that means I can just about put it anywhere. So what can I do in terms of using this as a practical in a scene. So without further ado, let's take a look at two scenes that I shot where all I did was use four of these LEDs. So in this first scene, I wanted to simulate what it would be like if I was filming in a car. And cars are hard to light because you don't have a whole lot of space and if you have more people in it, it gets even harder. So let's take a look at this real quick. Right here are my camera settings. I'm at F1.8 ISO 400 and all the LEDs in this scene are shooting at 100% brightness. Now, most of them have a diffusion plate in front of it as well as some colored gels or colored paper except for the one in the far back. So in this scene, I only have two of them. I have one that's sitting uh, in front of my speedometer. It's got a piece of paper followed by a green uh, color gel to kind of give me just a little bit of color, not a whole lot. And in the back, I have an LED shooting through my rear windshield and that is without a diffusion panel in front of it. So it's just a bare LED shooting right through it. Now it does need a little bit of level adjustments, but actually not too bad for F1.8 and ISO 400. Now let's take a look at this next shot over here. This next shot, you'll see that I've used two of the LEDs with a red and a blue gel followed by a diffusion plate, and they're kind of simulating my cop lights. And then of course, I still have the speedometer uh, LED pointed at me at 100%. And then in the back you see over there is the bare LED. So this is actually quite cool that I'm able to light an entire car scene with four of these. And obviously if I had more, I can shape the light a little bit more and kind of introduce some more ambiance. Now I find this to be quite awesome because I was shooting at only F1.8 ISO 400. I wasn't doing anything where I'm at like ISO 6400 with razor shallow depth of field. So that's how much these lights can actually pump out. Now obviously there might be some need for a little bit of level adjustments just to kind of give a little bit more contrast and kind of brighten up certain parts of the image. But actually this is not bad considering considering all of them had some sort of diffusion in front of it. Now this next scene here is my favorite where I start using these lights more as like a practical on scene or even to build the scene out as part of the set design. So what I have here is I have three of the LEDs mounted to the wall. My camera settings are F2.8 and my ISO is still at 400. And yet these LEDs on the wall are only shining at 5% output. And that is awesome because you clearly can see them. They're bringing in that nice little light, kind of a guide light, or if you're making a spaceship, you can kind of use these lights as spaceship. And then I have the other LED off to my right, and it's got a red gel on it, followed by a diffusion plate, and it's shooting at 100%, and it's able to light my face up. Now, granted, this LED is quite close. I would say it's about two feet away, just out of frame, and it works very well. So those are just some of the examples of what you can do with these LEDs in a very, very tight scene or using them as practicals, which I believe is where this LED really, really shines. 
Okay, so those are all the awesome things about this LEDs. What are the things that I did not like about this LED? There's really not a whole lot and they're really just nitpicky at this point. So the first one is I really, really wished that this LED was able to be powered with a USB power bank indefinitely. I was kind of surprised that it was actually drawing more power than the USB power bank. But at the same time, it kind of makes sense if they changed it and didn't use a USB port and maybe used a nine volt port, maybe we might have been able to power it with an external battery. But at this current time, you can't. But at the same time, I don't really think you're gonna be using it in that way because if you look at the way I used it practically, I was only shining at 5% and that thing is probably gonna last for quite a few hours when it's only outputting 5%. So in that case, if you do wire it and you're using at 5, 10, maybe even up to 25%, I think the USB power bank can keep up. Now this next thing is, again, another nitpick, but I kind of wish that they gave you a magnetic gel holder because the gels themselves are actually bigger than the LED. So when you do snap on the diffusion, it's actually going to overlap the LED and depending on how you have it set, maybe you don't want it to overlap. Specifically, back to the car scene. My red and blue gels over there, I had to make sure it wasn't overlapping on the bottom so that my LED could stand up on their own. I think it would have been cool if they had a little magnetic gel holder and basically you just slot the gel in and it's perfectly cut so that way you don't have to worry about the gel overlapping. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is this LED is actually quite awesome for the price point the way it's built, how small it is, and how much light output it actually gives you. Now, the reason I say this is because I think this light excels at being a practical and a set designed ambient light. Um, I would never use this as a key light unless I really, really have to to get a little shot. And mainly it's just because when it shoot, when you have this type of LED shooting at your subject, the shadows are really harsh and it's not exactly the most flattering light in the world. If that's the look you're going for, awesome. But generally speaking, I wouldn't necessarily use this as a key light. Now, the reason I'm saying this as practicals is because when you start looking at Hollywood movies and why an independent movie just doesn't quite look the same, if you take a living room scene, for example, the subjects are lit beautifully and all the furniture and all the light fixtures are also lit quite well. And generally speaking, I think this is because they actually have dimmer boxes to those lights. They're using tungsten bulbs or what have you, and they're able to dim it to the point where the camera sees that it's there, but it's not gonna actually blow out. So what I mean by this is when you look at an independent film sometimes in a living room scene, they'll have just your standard 60 watt or 100 watt LED bulbs and they'll light the subject just fine. But suddenly you have a lamp back there and you see this blown out shape, or you can see this little bulb in there that's completely blown out. And with Hollywood, you don't see that. You see every little nuance of that lamp fixture. And I know this seems like a very, very minuscule thing to think about, but somebody in Hollywood does think about that so that everything in your shot has as much texture and as much detail as possible, no matter how small that light is. And the fact that this thing is light and you can mount it anywhere, and even at 5%, it was actually technically blowing out in the highlights. It was at 100% completely, but you can hide this in a lot of things, in a lot of lamp fixtures and have it at 1% and then therefore the lamp is glowing but not glowing too much. So the last thing really is, is I'm very surprised by this LED that I was able to create those four scenes even though they're kind of minimal, but they were able to be created with simply just four of these LED lights. I'm kind of thinking to myself, well, what if I had 10 of them? What if I had 20 of them? The fact that my camera settings were at ISO 400 and I only went down as low as F 1.8, that says how powerful these things are. So I'm thinking to myself, well, what if I had not only a whole bunch of this, but I shot it on a Sony a7S or a GH5S, something where I can push that 
ISO performance and still get a clean image all the way up to 3200 or higher. And I'm st slowly starting to think, um, could I light an entire scene with just an army of these little things? Most likely, yes. Will I ever do it? No, because again, this light doesn't give the kind of quality I would want for everything. However, having 20 of these and hiding them all over the place to create the ambience and the practicality of certain lights in the scene, that is what I'm most interested in. Okay, so the question is, is would I recommend these lights in your narrative filmmaking kit? Absolutely. I think this thing is awesome for what it is. It's small, it's portable, it's very durable and well made. It's got an internal battery, you can charge it on the go, and it shoots an insane amount of light at your subject in a close distance. Which, if you are shooting a confined space where you can't bring in this big old LED panel, LED rod, or maybe the flex mat is not doing it for you, what have you. This thing can just hide somewhere there and you can craft the light to um, to light up the scene. And therefore, uh, you can shoot maybe a little bit wider because generally speaking, when you look at some interior car scenes, they're always close-up shots because they need to hide those lights. Whereas this thing, you can shoot a little bit wider and still be able to light up the scene like I did. And lastly, this light is awesome when you think about how to use it as a practical light. The fact that it's so light that I can stick to the wall, put it in plain sight of the camera, and only have it at 5% and still be bright enough for people to know that that's a guide light. I think that is awesome. Not only that, um, like I said, you can hide it inside lamp fixtures so that you can control the look of that light so that it's not blowing out in the camera and it just looks like it's part of the scene. That way your whole scene retains more detail and technically more dynamic range. And hey, that's it for this week, everybody. If this video has made all the influence in your purchasing decisions, I would really appreciate it if you check out my Amazon affiliate links down below. Again, this costs nothing extra to you. It just gives me a little compensation so I can continue making videos like this for you. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave it down below. I will get to them as fast as I can. Definitely like and subscribe because next week what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of venture into the DIY territory, some more tips and tricks on how to get the most out of this Sakani LED light. So tune in for that and I'll see you next week.